Get him. I got him. Get him. I Get got him. him. I got him. You got him? I got him. Hey, Michael. You ready? You ready? I'm herping. Alaska. In Alaska. Oh, I lost my hat. Hold For on. Real. For Let's real. Hold on. He's Hold on. hopping still. Is he still hopping? You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. He stopped hopping. I'm right on your hands. You sure? Let's go slow. There we go, Michael. We herped Alaska. I don't have any idea what kind of frog this is. It's we're in the Alaskan wilderness here fishing for grayling. Dana herp Alaska, Michael. I herped Alaska, Michael. <laughs> well, there go my parents trying to herp again. Little did they know what they found for their location was very significant. They were just outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, where they found that wood frog. And where they were is the northernmost extent of any amphibian's range in North America. So the wood frog is extremely adaptable to adverse conditions. They come up very early in the spring. And because of this, sometimes they run the risk of being caught in the elements. Usually, sometimes in the early spring, we get a few warm days, but then we can get some days that go below freezing. Sometimes if a nor'easter comes through, we can get a lot of snow. Now to survive this, just in case the wood frogs do wake up early to come lay their eggs, their bodies can literally freeze solid. They usually can get caught out in the elements for extended periods of time in this frozen state, and then once it warms back up, they come right back to life. Now, for all intensive purposes, the wood frog is not entirely dead per se. Their heartbeat does, however, stop when they're in this frozen state. Their whole outside of their body freezes solid, their legs freeze solid, but inside something very interesting is going on. The cells inside of their body are expanding to help keep them from freezing completely solid internally. So that is one of the really cool adaptations of the wood frog. Even the wood frog's eggs tolerate freezing, allowing them to be one of the first to utilize the vernal pools like the one behind me here. However, they are not the only amphibians that come to these vernal pools in the early spring. This little gray salamander right here, this is the Jefferson salamander. They are one of the first salamanders to migrate to the vernal pools, which usually occurs during late winter, early spring. This is part of their survival strategy. They beat most of the other amphibians to the pools, and get there and lay their eggs first before any other spring migrants arrive. Now as spring progresses, many other amphibians will show up to these vernal pools and utilize them to lay their eggs. The vernal pools are virtually free of fish and many other predators that would eat young amphibians. So that's why these areas are very important safe havens for them. Now it's extremely important that we do everything we can to protect these areas for future generations of amphibians. Once these vernal pools are gone, if someone comes in and drains them for development reasons, that whole amphibian population in the area could potentially collapse. So for future generations to enjoy these amphibians, we need to do everything we can to protect them. Well, you never know what my parents are gonna be getting into on their Sharing the Outdoors channel. But if you're really into herping, be sure to stop by and check out my channel on YouTube and watch my never ending herping series. I'm Michael with Camo Chair Productions, and we hope to see you again real soon. <laughs>